<laughs> I think I broke Unlike Uncle play. Banzai, we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of them. We're back. So we got a lot to cover. Scylla and Charybdis. Now, this is a real interesting, maybe a little bit dicey episode. Okay, so hopefully I can bring you some new insight and something to make this uh, a little more easy to get through. Okay, so I'm going to try to open some doors for you and, and make this chapter more fun than it might have been the first time you read it. Now I encourage you after this video to go back and reread that chapter and I think you'll get a little bit more out of it because there's some pretty esoteric kind of references and I'm gonna blow the doors off the the whole thing here so I'm gonna give you a big piece of insight and when you go back you'll see it and say aha Joyce is a genius and that's why we're doing this for fun right so now before I start I have something I want to address here I have a comment I want to make I got a comment from one of you that said that well I got I got an adorable now in the history of Joyce videos Ulysses videos lectures uh, uh, books written on the subject essays written on the subject I doubt that anyone ever in the history of Joyce editorials has ever gotten an adorable. Thank you. I appreciate it and it means a lot to me and I will cherish it and if I had a little trophy I would put it on the wall for every video. That's how much I appreciate your comments. And it's nice to get an adorable for a Joyce video. Now there's another thing I want to address here, and that's this whole di uh, idea of Scylla and Charybdis. You'll see online news, how do you pronounce these things? And people will say that Charybdis, that can't be, that's impossible, it's, a, it's an error, somebody's made a mistake along the line. There are no female gods that end with an S. You'll see this comment frequently. Well, if anybody says that to you, or you come across that comment, you might mention Nemesis. Nemesis was a Greek goddess that certainly does end with an S. So they're wrong. So you can be a, a wise guy. I mean, part of reading Joyce is you're going to be a wise guy anyway, right? So there's one for you. Now let's get, let's get on with our episode. In the Odyssey, Odysseus is faced with having to navigate between these two big hazards. Um, I, it, it, these things always make me think, well, why didn't he just go around? Like he had to go between two islands and the only way to get there was there was this big hazard on the right and the other hazard on the left. And I think, well, why didn't you just go around? I mean, the guy's been sailing for 10 years, right? Trying to get home to go around the island. But um, I guess it didn't work that way in those days. So he's faced with Scylla and Charybdis. Now, Charybdis is this cyclone. Uh, it's a it's a big drain in the ocean. It's spinning around and it will suck you in and take everything there is. And after it sucks everything down, drowns and destroys, then it spits it all back up in a day. So it has a daily cycle of draining everything down and then after it drains everything down sucks it all into the bottom of the sea then it spits it up later now you can identify where this whirlpool is because it is underneath this big fig tree 
so the fig tree is probably an attraction for ships that uh, oh there'd be food or shade or or it looks like an island so they go to the fig tree and then they get sucked in so underneath this tree is this whirlpool drain that pulls everything in it sucks you down Scylla is a six-headed monster that uh, each head needs a meal so chomp 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 if you go through and face Scylla you're going to lose uh, at least six people because all those six heads are gonna eat so Odysseus is faced with a choice what's he gonna do when he when he's gonna sail this route is he gonna try to survive being sucked in or is he going to face the monster and take his losses and he decides ultimately to uh, take his losses and he does lose six crew members who get picked off by this thing and uh, he does make it through now eventually in the Odyssey he ends up back behind this thing and he has to go through it again the second time that Odysseus passes through these straits and again you think if you had to go all the way back why don't you just go around don't you learn but the second time he goes through he decides to go to the fig tree and he hangs on the tree he jumps up grabs onto a branch it sucks the ship down everything is lost and he hangs from the fig tree and eventually it spits the ship back up everybody's dead no survivors the ship comes up to the top bobs like a cork he jumps down on it and sails away so it, it's it's kind of an interesting uh, metaphor I'm not sure exactly what Homer is trying to get across there but you can ponder that but in this first run he makes the decision to face Scylla rather than Charybdis so he's going the six-headed beast route now where are we in Ulysses so Bloom is out looking for the keys ad so he's going to show up here at the National Library Stephen is here at the National Library and he sent a telegram to Mulligan telling him that I'm not going to meet you at the bar uh, I'm going to be at the library I'm going to have this literary discussion with all these uh, upper literary genius guys because I want to be kind of on the in crowd but not part of what they're doing so Stephen is sort of uh, around these guys but not in their circle and he's has mixed feelings about wanting to be part of it but not wanting to be part of it so there's a kind of a mixed jumble there so Stephen is in the middle of this discussion at the National Library with AE and some other literary characters and we'll see that unfold as we go through the chapter so what's really going on here now I want to hit you with something huge I said at the beginning that I was going to just blow the doors off I want to just blow your mind here let me lay this out for you this episode is really about that word that Molly asked about way back when remember menom psychosis and and Bloom said well that's like a, a transmigration of the souls of reincarnation this episode is a bit of transmigration of the souls where Bloom and Stephen are kind of morphing a bit now Stephen starts out thinking about He's, he's looking at AE and there's reference to the big beard and I'll have some pictures of these guys that I'll put in the video near the end and he has this big beard and Stephen's thinking about that and the guy sort of plays with the beard and and Stephen remembers that he owes him money he owes him a pound and then he says well you know but but the the, the molecules change right because we're always we drop molecules get new molecules cells die we slough them off we make new ones and Stephen thinks ah, do I owe him or was that the old me you know who that's the new me that's uh, here now so uh, maybe he doesn't know him 
Now what's interesting about that is remember in the in the last episode Bloom had a very similar thought. He was thinking about Molly and he said me then, me now, happier then and he sort of thinks about this idea about whether it's the same hymn or whether that was an old hymn or a, a, a different hymn. Was that just a different time or was that a different person? And he says, happier, happier then. Things changed after Rudy. Um, so, so Bloom is dealing with the same issue. Now I would say that this book is not a recreation of the Odyssey. This is certainly not, Bloom is not out looking for a son, okay? And Stephen is not out looking for a father. But they are looking for themselves. And I believe that the name Bloom was chosen by Joyce because this character will bloom into the being that Joyce wants to be or that he sees as as a good, mature, thinking, solid, intelligent character. That that name Bloom has very... That Joyce doesn't choose any words frivolously. That has meaning. And so he's thinking about that and that Bloom is evolving and blooming into something. Now, Stephen Daedalus is Joyce's alter ego in his earlier books. Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man is the story of Stephen Dedalus, which is really Joyce's autobiographical piece. All right, it's really about himself. But he's growing up, he is maturing, and we're seeing the metempsychosis of these characters where that, as I say, Bloom is not looking for a son, Stephen is not looking for a father, they're looking for themselves, and we are going to see Bloom, Bloom to the mature man. And we're going to see, ultimately, that Joyce puts away the Stephen character and becomes the mature Bloom type character. Okay? So, Keep that in mind as you go through this chapter because there are some rather esoteric references to what's going on here. But you will see as we go forward that Bloom is blooming. All right, Stephen is still struggling to find himself and what he wants to be and where he wants to go and how he wants to do his life. But Bloom knows what his problems are and he's trying to figure them out. He's got the issue with Molly and he's just life in general. He's working through things. On we go. Okay. So we're developing the great theme of the book, this idea of bloom, which I think this is where Joyce is really the genius. This is where it just gets beautiful touching if this doesn't reach your soul then I don't you haven't got one because this is this is as good as it gets his words he's got humor in here but it's very touching to see this development of these characters this this blooming so watch for it in this chapter and watch for how Joyce explains this idea to us without clobbering us on the head and being so obvious about it. And I've mentioned that concept before, that Joyce doesn't just put it out there for you. He gives you all the parts and lets you go to that mental playground and build it yourself. So where do we see this idea of bloom blooming? Stephen gets into this theory of his. Now, this, for a lot of readers, this is kind of messy up. You know, Stephen's talking about the, the, the son being his own father, and, and Shakespeare was his own father, and his son died, and what wasn't broken? If there wasn't a sunder, there can't be a reconciliation. He's dealing with this thing with his wife, uh, and 
you know, what in the heck is Stephen thinking about? And what is this wacky theory that the son is really his own father? And, you know, so let's let's see if we can parse that a bit and put it together, because it is rather interesting. And, you know, the minute we get too serious about this and say, oh, this is a Freudian analysis of the, you know, and then they ask Stephen, well, do you believe this? And he says, no. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> we're we're kind of cautioned by Joyce not to take this all too seriously, but he's trying to tell us something here. And what he's trying to tell us is, I think, very fascinating stuff. All right. So let's let's take a look at it. In Hamlet, now Shakespeare had a son, Hamnet, and he died, we don't know the cause, probably plague. He died at 11 years old. Now, see how all this stuff starts fitting together. You know, Rudy's, it's been over 10 years since Rudy died. And, you know, here's Shakespeare's son died at 11. And Shakespeare, in, in the play Hamlet, when they produced the play, Shakespeare himself played the role of his father's ghost. So when you hear, you know, Shakespeare... I am your father, you know, that's Shakespeare playing the role of his father. So that's why Stephen gets into this thing about Shakespeare is his own father, and he also lost a son, the son becomes the father, and that, you know, this whole thing gets kind of blended up. But there's a clue in there about this idea that I'm giving you about Bloom blooming, that this book is really about that. Now, keep keep that in mind, okay, as you go through. This is a this is a whiz bang fun chapter if you allow yourself to play with it. If you try to over intellectualize it, it can get rough. You, there's a lot there if you want to do that. But I say if you just enjoy it, wow, Joyce has really built the playground and there's a lot of stuff to play on. There's swings and slides and all kinds of jazz we can play around on here. So keep that in mind. So we have Hamlet and Hamnet, the the sons. We have the the son, Shakespeare, being his own father. So we have this this blending of these characters. Now think about some of these lines that, that come out in the in the chapter. There is a great quote in there that one says, the boy in Act 1 is the mature man in Act 5. Bloom. Boom. Drop the mic. Boom. I think that's just amazing that that just pops out in conversation. Now I think Joyce is telegraphing you that you know, the young guy early in this book is the mature guy later in the book. Watch for this development. Watch for this this metempsychosis that's going on that he gave us right at the beginning. That that's what this book is going to be about. Molly and her put the thumbnail on the book and make the little mark. And what is this word? You know, who, who, who tell us who he is when he's at home. That's what it's all about. Okay? So we're starting to see some very interesting development here. So again, the quote, the boy in Act 1 is the mature man in Act 5. Wonderful stuff. I find this just absolutely fascinating. There's a lot of little jokes in this episode, too. I love it when Stephen's thinking about he owes A.E. The guy's going on and on, you know, and, and Stephen's thinking that he owes him money. And uh, did he make good use of the money? And then there's that quote, I paid my way, I paid my way. He thinks of Deasy's words when Deasy tells him that he's always paid his way. And, uh, you know, Stephen starts thinking about that. I paid my way. And he, he got the money from A.E., borrowed a pound, and then he went off and, and drank it. And then he went to a, uh, a bordello and used it on a prostitute. And um, he probably has some health consequences of that. And so he's kind of rehashing, what did I do with that money? I bought, oh, that's right. Yeah, now I now I remember. He probably told him he needed a pair of shoes or something. And, you know, 
we know how he did it. And then he thinks about, well, do I owe him? And he's really changed, and he's he's uh, and knew him. Does, is it me that owes him, or old me, or, um, you know, there's that little bit in there. And then he says, A-E, I O U, you know, which is, you remember from school about learning the vowels, A-E-I-O-U. So Joyce is always playing around. There's all kinds of little fun things in this chapter to look out for. There's also, as they talk about the Irish literary revival. Now, this is big stuff. The Irish literary revival is very serious stuff. So we, and I'll do more on this later. But they talk about all these serious works and bringing together these great minds. In fact, this very evening, there's going to be a little get together and they're going to bring together the best young poets and they're going to have a little reading. And Stephen is not invited. Who is invited? Well, the best young poets of our time, which Stephen certainly fancies himself as one of those, but he's not invited. But who is? Mulligan. Buck Mulligan. Here's this dolt from the tower that did the phony uh, service while he's shaving, and he's a boozer, and certainly not somebody you would think of as an intellectual. He's invited to this gathering of the best young poets, and Stephen is not. And they talk about it with him sitting there. They don't say, well, oh, by the way, if you're, you know, doing nothing, what? they don't even make an effort to do that. And Stephen feels slighted, which is another thing that's kind of interesting about this chapter, but he wants really nothing to do with this Irish literary revival. And, and Joyce, almost as though, you know, he's looking down on this scene as he's writing it, and then he just he inserts this comment, it, the, uh, the best book to come out of our country, one thinks of Homer. Yeah, I think that's just a riot. Um, Homer, of course, that's the author of the Odyssey, Ulysses. So the best book to come out of our country one thinks of Homer. It's you, you just can't make this stuff up. Well, I guess you can. He did, right? So, I mean, I think that's so extremely clever that uh, Joyce, while they're talking about this Irish literary revival and excluding Stephen from it and all this jazz, then end comes this comment about the best book to come out of our country. One thinks of Homer. It's just it's a it's a riot. The guy's sense of humor is just amazing, and his intellectual capacity with words just blows my mind. There's so many dynamics happening in this chapter that are fun. So let's look at Scylla and Charybdis as it affects Stephen. All right. Now, Stephen was offered work at the newspaper. You know, they wanted him to write something, write something in Gaelic for the newspaper. And Stephen didn't want to do it. And he wasn't going to do it. And then remember, he told him that that story about the uh, uh, the the um, plums of Pisca, right? That the two women went up the tower and spit the seeds out and and left them kind of shaking their heads. He blew him off. He didn't want to get involved. He's not going to write junk for the paper. He's not going to write stuff for mass consumption. That's not going to happen. So he's basically decline that now he's got Scylla you know so rather than get sucked into the life of just writing junk for the newspaper to please the editor and the masses public consumption he doesn't want to get sucked into that because once you get in you start getting a paycheck you never get out and he knows that now he has to face these guys and the Irish literary revival he talks about A E W B, Sing, uh, Lady um, Gregory. There's a there's a whole cast of characters that are trying to revive the old Irish language, Irish tradition, mythology, all the old stuff. Stephen wants no part of that, but here he is in the library, and you got these six heads. 
I don't know how many there are, trying to pick him off. He's facing Scylla here at the library, and he doesn't want to be part of this Irish literary revival. And to an extent, they're kind of excluding him anyway, because he's not going to be part of the best young poets to come along and uh, read at this thing. Now, Mulligan is a real character based on a guy um, named Gogarty. Uh, I, I believe it's uh, St. John Gogarty, I think is his full name. This is the, the Mulligan character. They, they, he and uh, Joyce, <laughs> boy, I'm keeping the name straight here, were friends. Uh, and this guy, Gogarty, was very offended by his uh, portrayal as Mulligan in the book. And Gogarty actually became part of this Irish literary revival and did some writing for that. He was a medical student. He was a, a drunken jokester. He's everything that Buck Mulligan is. And uh, he did become part of this crowd and work on this Irish literary revival. Now again, they want to bring back the old language and the old traditions. And anytime you see a reference to uh, Fergus, that's that's part of that mythology. You, you'll see several references in this episode that tie into that stuff. Now what happened, Joyce moved away. He left Ireland, right? And the Irish literary revival evolved and eventually there was a uh, uh, a bit of a, a revolution in Ireland they did manage to eventually get home rule and then they fell into civil war and then this Irish literary revival uh, took hold and they actually forced the schools to teach in Gaelic and so the kids had to learn that the Irish language which was a disaster because the parents at home obviously didn't speak it. They didn't grow up with it. Remember the milk lady way back at the beginning when they, they say that, you know, Haynes is there and he says, you know, oh, uh, the Irish language, you know, say something in Irish. And, and she doesn't know the language. She doesn't remember it, you know, and, and she's an old lady and she doesn't remember it. It's died out. It's gone. So the result of this Irish literary revival is that they force Gaelic to be taught in the schools. They force the schools to teach in Gaelic, not just teach the language, but to teach the courses in Gaelic. So you had a generation of kids grow up with this language that was not used anywhere. It wasn't used throughout the British Isles. The parents didn't speak it. The grandparents barely remembered it. It wasn't used on the continent. So you had a generation of kids that for all intents and purposes were illiterate and it caused great poverty. It put Ireland back 50 years. Ireland, by the way, is one of the most successful nations on earth today. If you look it up, their, their um, uh, GDP is great. The, the country is thriving and, and doing great, but it took them a long time to overcome all this crud that Joyce says, don't go to that Scylla, don't get picked off with that stuff. And he resisted it. He even moved away from Ireland to do his writing because he could feel that Scylla and Charybdis picking them off and sucking them in. And so that revival really cost the country dearly, which I, I think is kind of fascinating the way that played out in, in real so to wrap this up, again, Bloom is at the library. Now what's he doing there? Why is Bloom at the library? The library was a meeting place for intellectuals. They would get together and have these discussions like Stevens engaged in with this Shakespeare theory of his, which now we understand what that's really all about. So go back and reread that and pay attention to it. Why is Bloom at the library? Bloom is looking for keys. Okay, remember he was going to place the ad, and they said, well, can you get a mock-up? Remember, he said, I want two keys, you know, cross, cross like this, you know, with the, the, with the name keys, you know, play on home rule. Remember that? So 
Joyce is here at the library to dig up some old newspapers to find a copy of the keys uh, symbol logo drawing so that he can use it in the ad. So we have Bloom at the library looking for keys and we have Stephen at the library dealing with Scylla and trying to find his own way. So these two characters are crossing paths and meeting but not seeing each other and doing this really interesting stuff and we have Bloom there looking for keys. It just doesn't get any better than that. Now, very near the end, Mulligan starts making some jokes because he sees, he saw Bloom, he saw Bloom come in and he, he gives Stephen a little ribbing about that. He says, hey, your buddy's here. And they make reference to pederasty, which is, you know, homosexuality that Bloom is, he's, he's hot for you. Bloom's pursuing you. And he gives Stephen a bad time about it. Now, maybe that Mulligan is jealous. Maybe Mulligan's just a jerk. Stephen pretty much blows it off. He just ignores it. But we're going to find out that Bloom is going to Bloom. And I think you already know, but we're going to see down the road who the real friend is and what Bloom's real motivations are. Now, Bloom may not be a, a, a close connection with Stephen, but he's certainly a protector. And Bloom is there looking for keys and he's going to find them. Thanks. I really appreciate your comments. Thumbs up the video. Subscribe. Ask questions. Participate. And enjoy this. You're adorable. Until next time. You're back. You're back already. This is a bonus video. I'd like to show you some of these characters. First up, Gogarty. Number two. This is so I know where to put the picture. Clever, huh? A.E. A.E. is George Russell. The guy with the beard, right? Lady Gregory. Now, Lady Gregory is an a interesting character. She went off, traveled the countryside, and, and went way out in what we would consider the sticks, which is a pretty bold thing for a woman to do, to travel by herself off into the extreme boonies and, and stay there for long periods of time to record the uh, mythology and tradition and and you know she's part of this revival so she was off looking for the the ancient stories and she had a lot to do with capturing a lot of the old Irish uh, myths and histories and traditions so she's quite known um, Lady Gregory then we have John Singh uh, he's referred to in the episode number four John Singh and last but definitely not least number five WB WB in the episode is WB Yeats Yeats is a great poet I love Yeats I love his work I would encourage you to look up some poetry by Yeats and see if it doesn't catch you these references to Fergus are largely from Yeats he writes uh, he has a lot of references uh, Fergus uh, the curlew um, a lot of the old Irish tradition that was his thing was to bring that stuff into poetry so I wanted you to see those characters and then finally here's a shot of the National Library so you know where all these guys are hanging out and give you a sense of where they are cheers <laughs>